Hello, I'm Gillian Drake, the Director of New Works in Action at Spooky Action Theatre. I hope you enjoyed Run Out of Sky, and will stay with us while I chat with the playwright, uh, Leslie Bram, and the director, Alec Wild, who are with me now uh, on Zoom, of course. Um, first, I want to introduce Leslie Bram. He's an award-winning playwright and the author of over 20 plays. His work has been produced both regionally and internationally. He's originally from San Francisco, but he has called New York City his home for almost 40 years. He attended the Juilliard School of Music and sang for an indie rock band called Dizdam. So welcome, Leslie. Thank you. And uh, Alec uh, Wild is our director, and he's a director and writer and was the artistic director of the Folio Theater in Chicago, the Illinois Shakespeare Festival, and the Great River Shakespeare Festival in Minnesota. He directs for both film and stage. His last film, Whisper, was an official selection for the St. Louis Filmmakers Showcase and the St. Louis International Film Festival. Currently, Alec is the director of the Academy for Classical Acting at the Shakespeare Company in, here in Washington, D.C., which is an MFA program in residence at George Washington University. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for your fantastic work. Thanks, Gillian. Glad to be here. Indeed. So the first question is for Leslie. Leslie, um, you about your playwriting aesthetic, you told me three things. Everything you know about playwriting, you learned from Aristotle and the Beatles. You were kicked out of Juilliard. Yes. And that your play ABC was banned from curriculum at SUNY College. So you sound like a little bit of a troublemaker. Uh, so just what happened and, but more importantly, how do these three things explain your approach to? Well, from Aristotle, I learned all the mechanics you need to write a play. It's pretty much the poetics is, is it. You don't need anything after that. And from the Beatles, I learned six steadfast rules that have sort of governed me when I write, um, which is really simply, you, you make your characters quirky, you keep your cliches cheeky, you layer in the details, and you find a way to make any accident you have in the script, you find a way to make them into art. You be a bastard when you have to, and never, and this is the most important one, never ever settle on a single style. Wow. So, so that because I didn't study playwriting formally anywhere. Uh, I, I come from I come to the theater from a, a far different place. So I needed to ground myself somehow. And, and so Aristotle and the Beatles seem to be what I needed. That sounds great. Do you want to comment on the uh, uh, it's really interesting. I think those are amazing. Those are good rules. I like the idea that sometimes you have to be a bully or at least pushy. And, well, and, and your own script, it's like, it's like Faulkner said, you have to know when it's time to strangle your little darlings. <laughs> so, so you have to be a bastard with your own text sometimes uh, for the sake of the play. Uh-huh. And um, what was the last one? Oh, and you never settle on a single style. Yeah. Because there's this, I, I love so many different types of theater and so many different types of theater excite me. And I just don't, I would never want to be the kind of writer that was said, I'm going to write, you know, a la one, one particular voice. So does that mean, I know that you have a lot of uh, musical background. Do you work in lyrics or do you work, um, have you done immersive work you, or is this all in terms of the voice of, of, of narrative? It's, it's really in terms of the voice of narrative. I. I've never written a musical. It's something that if it was the right, if I had the right lyricist and the right composer that I would absolutely be interested in doing. It just, that hasn't come into my uh, horizon yet, but who knows? Well, I, there's a lot of music in your writing. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's important to me because it really is the, 
the best way I know how to put a play together. And I know a lot of writers will, you know, I know I'll, I'll be talked about using classical music um, mm -hmm. as a basis. And August Wilson used jazz and the blues. And for me, rock and roll, because it's, it's, it's primitive. Um, the, the, the ABCs of like constructing it are very much like theater to me. And it's, it's because it is a primitive art form, it's really easy to pick those things out. If that makes any sense. It's, it's interesting. Then I know we're talking, we might as well talk about this now. So the music here, there, it seems very, we, we call it a poem. I mean, that's what we say it sounds like, but mostly because the, the interplay of the words, it's very, it, it's, it has, um, Lot, each each of these characters has kind of a, their own sort of fugue-like line through it, and um, it just I, I'm assuming that the, that had uh, that music somehow played in the. Oh, it did absolutely. Whenever I begin working on a play, I usually find a song or a band that to me sets the emotional tone of the play or what I'm what I'm going for, uh, and so I can use that as a, like a jumping off point, but also go back and reference that when I feel that I've, I've fallen out of touch with the script. For Run Out of Sky, there's a, a great song on the Revolver album called For No One. And that really was what sort of ground me emotionally to that character. So it doesn't actually have to be, you know, so we, we were talking earlier about music, whether we were, whether Alec, was going to uh, lay in some music on this or live in silence. So that's actually a different conversation than what inspired you emotionally for the, the through line of your language. Indeed. Um, but I, I found when I, I watched, when I, when I watched the play um, that the, the actor's emotional life, the, the richness that she brought to it was in itself musical. And some of the most powerful things that I thought she did in it is when she wasn't speaking at all. And that's when like, I thought the music of the character really came out. When, when you saw what she was feeling just like come out of that great face. So Alec, for you, I know that you had talked about, you had actually thought or prepared to put music under to underscore it. So can you just talk about that that choice and and how you got there? Because it was it was definitely a, you know strong, just completely quiet. It was very beautiful. Sure, yeah. I mean, like Leslie, I I I love music and I love uh, using it in projects. I think um, you know the, there were a couple of things. First of all, uh, I agree. I think I think Shinar's performance was just really really strong and um, you know emotionally engaged. I was I when I first Set, you know, decided to do the play. I was reading, uh, not reading, but listening to uh, online to some emergencies happening in air traffic control, and one of the one of the things that was so fascinating to me was the silences. You know, where there'd be something over the radio, and then a wait waiting for either the pilot to respond or air traffic controllers. And it was really, the silence was very scary. It was a very powerful silence, and <laughs> and so I kind of connected that in the play to the, the silences that this woman is hearing from her, her, her husband, um, uh, you know, that, that that silence is deafening and waiting for the next thing to be said can be really, really painful and powerful. And I just thought her performance was so strong and really, really evoked that nicely. And at, when I started to lay in a little music, I just felt like it was kind of emotionally undercutting the, the, the play and, you know, Les's language is so strong um, and so lyrical in itself too that I wanted that to really be the thing that came through. Well, I also heard she used, uh, Shannara used three, three, it, it wasn't obvious, three completely different voices for each of the parts of this woman in, in each of those different scenes. The, she had the, that kind of flat thing for the air controller and this this kind of let it loose voice of the woman at the counter and then another and it was in a different part of her voice so i thought that was really i don't know if that's something you guys discussed or um uh, it just came out of the rehearsal or the work 
We did discuss it actually. Uh, we we talked about who each of the three women were. Well, well, it was the same woman, but which part of her they were, and you know, um, and uh, I think you, you know, Shannara just really did a terrific job of delineating, you know, where where she was and whether she was sort of the professional, you know, air traffic controller, or whether she was, you know, in that in in the moments of anger and hurt after, you know, uh, uh, or if, or if she was really really in that very reflective place. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I uh, that worked. Mm -hmm. But also, what I noticed is that I mean, op what you did beautifully is they had three completely different physicalities, and I know that we, you and I had talked about the fact that um, not only do you work classical text, but you studied biomechanics. You have to tell me what that means at um, the St. Petersburg uh, Academy of Theater. And so clearly it's not just language that you work with, but that movement and body language is a very par important part of your aesthetic. You have this little tiny film, you had three little scenes and her and her physicality was also uh, different. So that must have been another choice that you were at least talking about with your actress. It was, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, language is sort of my first love. And it's kind of where I first, you know, connect to plays and connect to the theater. And when I went to study in Russia, um, I, 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 you know, I, I thought that the best, the best possible play was, you know, a, a, a very, very high language, well costumed, well, well designed, you know, Renaissance re restoration uh, uh, comedy or something like that. I, I just lived for those, you know, I lived for the wit and the, um, and the charm. And I, I think a lot of my early work as a, as a theater director, um, kind of, kind of had, uh, uh, you know, kind of relied heavily on language and not so much on physicality. So it, I always sort of would place people in very pretty positions and then I just have them stand and talk. Um, and so when I went to, to St. Petersburg, I was, uh, I was, I, I kind of resisted it for a while, you know, this kind of constructivist, you know, we don't need language. We need the actor's body to tell the story. Um, and, uh, but, but after a while I started to see the power of it and the power of silence and the power that a body can have in telling a story. Um, uh, you know, Meyerhold, the biomechanics was essentially this, this system that he came up with of, of etudes that actors would learn. He felt that any emotion could be expressed purely physically. Um, and so that, that actually became a huge uh, influence on me in my work. And, uh, and now I, I hope to be marrying kind of my love of language, which is of course what attracted me to this play in the first place, because I, the, the language is, is so beautiful and um, poetic and smart and, uh, uh, you know, creative. Um, and yet I, I really try to bring sort of a, a, a strong physicality to my work too. Well, you see it at your at the academy because you I, when I go to see the student uh, shows, the physicality is a incredibly strong part of the performance. So that was, um, so you brought that kind of, I mean, I'm sure it was there, but this has been an important part of the discipline of bringing out Shakespeare as well. Well, yeah, I think one of the things that attracted me to the Academy was the strong movement faculty there. You know, we have Dodi DeSanto uh, in mask and Chris Cherry, who's doing uh, Alexander Technique and Roberta Steam, who's uh, our movement person. Lisa Lise, uh Jordan is our stretch person and their, their work is just extraordinary. And I think that really comes through in the students uh, when you see our performances. Uh, uh, we're, 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 we're about the body very much there. Yeah, that's good. Um, so we'll go, but Leslie, so about physicality, you told me you had a profound fear of flying. I do. I absolutely had, do. And this had, but you have someone here that is um, uh, uh, an air pilot, pilot control. So I just want to know if that had anything to do. How, tell me about the origins of the play and the piece and, and this and how you landed on this subject and whether your fear has any input into this language well if, if it if it did it, it was it was probably completely unconscious because <laughs> i i didn't you know think it's like oh well I'm, I'm terrified of flying so let me then bring that out in a in a play somewhere it's uh the the origin of the play really was i i just wanted to write uh a poem for the stage it was something that that really intrigued me uh, just, just the idea of keeping something concise and condensed mm -hmm. and trying to use the simplest 
because I tend to be a windbag sometimes and, and full length plays. So it's the trying to like really keep the language constrained. So everything was, um, everything had meaning and, and the juxtaposition was of, of taking uh, a, a character that's that's been hurt personally and juxtaposing it to like a huge disaster. The thing I was very inspired to, I, I saw this in a, a Harold Pinter play where the characters were talking, he was, he's researching a book on the, the Holocaust and, and she's pacing around and it starts out very Pinter-esque with no one speaking. And you see, he's looking at all these horrible, horrible images. And then the play begins and she says, I had an affair. And all of a sudden, everything that he was looking at that was so horrible, just shrunk to almost nothing because the, emo and so that intrigued me and I wanted to write something and, and something that, that did that very thing. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling around a bit. It's, uh, that's really interesting. If that's kind of this uh, emotional launching pad, that's, it's interesting that we yes. have. Uh, so, hmm. so if- Alec is much better at this than I am. As you can, if anyone watching can plainly tell this interview. Oh God, no, no. <laughs> really interesting notion. So you, I mean, this is not at all like that, of course, but the idea that there is this, that comparative disasters are, uh, and watching her kind of shape that is, is a really interesting notion. And I think that's certainly when we divide it up into three, which is what we should talk about, because that makes me, uh, so originally it's uh, conceived as three actors mm -hmm. and and it's conceived originally for the stage, right? Yes. And, so, and uh, Alec is who's worked in, in film and, and theater and actually uh, created these audio plays for SDC this past spring. So I'd like to ask what, so you, I don't know if you knew the play was, was for the stage, but when you were shaping this play for a digital performance, what elements did you have to translate? How did you, how, and did having one actress do three, did that, was that part of that transforming to a whole different medium? That's a great question. Uh, I did know it was for the stage when I first read it and was attracted to it as a play for the stage. Um, uh, a, a, as a theater piece, I thought it was kind of, kind of a lovely, uh, you know, wonderfully simple uh, theater poem as, as Leslie called it. I think, I think it was great. So, yeah, uh, let me ask your answer your second question first, which is that that I think casting Shannara, who's my wife, um, was largely a matter of practicality during the pandemic. I, you know, I thought, well, I could do a Zoom thing, uh, or I could, you know, maybe have a little bit more control of of the filming and cast uh, the best actress in the world, uh, who I live with, to to be in uh, in in the thing. And so and so that and so I asked her if she'd do it, and she said sure. And um, you know, it gave us a rare up the rare opportunity to work together uh, on a project, which was interesting to both of us, which was really fun. Um, but it's 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 a very different piece than I think we'd see in the theater, you know. Um, in the theater lights up on three women, right? And so we're seeing them all at the same time. And uh, and so in Leslie's script, we have these, the, 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 the language comes much more staccato, you know, a line from this woman, a line from this woman, a line from this woman, and, and you know, mixed, mixed around. So that you get this sense of a, of a kind of choral feeling from the three women. And uh, when I did the first edit, I had sort of I sort of did that. I, I, I like kind of st stuck to Leslie's script, and I realized that we, you know, for film, when we only are looking at one face, it just was cutting too fast. You know, it was like it was like, what was that? Oh, what was that? What was that? So so um, so Leslie had given me full permission to kind of uh, play um, and do and adapt as I needed to in terms of uh, you know because we were using one actress uh, and because it was being filmed. So I started playing with sort of longer sections, trying to get an. Inter I, I sort of chose the air traffic controller as our main character and sort of tried to int introduce us to her for a bit before we started introducing the other characters. And, um, and so that was a huge difference, I think, uh, in, in adapting it to the film. Um, you know, I wanted, to, but mostly I wanted to make the story come through. Uh, and I, I think it does nicely. Well, that idea of, of storytelling, uh, that was a 
this is a really tricky play. And that, of course, had to be part of that, which one's going to tell the story better in this particular uh, format. And I think when I, I think when I told you, I think when I first read it, and we were thinking of it for Zoom, that mm. this idea that it's really one person's voice also kind of comes through. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a really, really different kind of choice. So I love the, 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 um, the little segues where we go to the next version, but I'm hearing the other voice and mm. obviously we couldn't have done that on Zoom. That was nice. Mm. Um, Leslie, you originally conceived this for the stage. So after seeing this, what did you, how do you compare them? Well, I think, I think in, in a lot of ways um, that it, it was three characters. I didn't get a sense. Yes, it was obviously the same actor, but I really, I thought they did a, a fantastic job of, of capturing three distinct parts of this, this woman's being and her personality at this juncture, like the, the sort of the, the controlled repressed air traffic controller to the almost comedic woman in the kitchen to the the more wounded animal in the bathroom and i so i thought all three of the case so it really it was a three character play to me with the way in which they did it so yeah ah, yeah um but there uh, what was i going to ask about uh the three characters so i was thinking about the storytelling part of this so when i first read it there are sometimes the women have in your script very distinctive voices and and little through lines that they're thinking about and there are times in which they are anybody could say, have said any of those lines and it would be the, you know it would make no difference so when I, I was reading that to me is a very tricky storytelling apparatus right that's a and um i want to know from maybe from Alec, uh, how did you deal with, did you feel the same that sometimes they were ubiquitous and hmm. sometimes they had their own little voice? Yeah, um, you know, I think, I think when you direct something, uh, you, you, you really try, you really dig deep and try and find the through line that each character has. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, and I think that's the, the feeling that you mentioned about how some of the characters, any of the characters could have said that line. That, that has more to do, I think, with the playfulness of the language in the script, that, right? That, that, that it's kind of, that that's what makes it musical, right? That, that, that there are these kind of um, arias that each of them is singing, and then every once in a while, they come together and, the, and, the, and, and they all sing the same thing, you know? And, and I think that's, the, that's kind of the, the 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 playful part of the script that that's that's really enjoyable you know what i mean so i so i guess yes to both your questions i think there's I, I think we really worked hard to delineate each of these people you know and what their experience their their sort of perspective on the experience was and then sometimes they joined you know and both you know and all had the same uh uh the the the, the same thing to say at the same time uh yeah. in the same way you know yeah. uh i think that was what we were going for it was great. It was very excellent. Uh, um, uh, so actually, so that leads me to the next one. Leslie, have you had other of your plays produced on Zoom? I have. I have. I just had a, an invited reading of a brand new play that I've spent the last couple of years developing at the actor studio. And it was the the first uh, Zoom invited reading. And, you know, thank God there was there were no technical glitches. Nobody froze up. I mean, we were, it was very fortunate in that sense. And you know, it's like, look, Zoom is, Zoom is not live theater. Zoom will never be uh, live theater. And, but at, at, in the times that we're living now in these pandemic times, uh, you, you have a choice of you're, you're either gonna work or you're not gonna work. And I have so many colleagues here in New York that just said, you know, Zoom is not theater. I refuse to participate. I'll just wait for this whole thing to be over with. And, you know, and that's, that's a point of view. But it, to me, it's like, if, if, you're, you know, if you're gonna write, if you're gonna create, you take advantage of any medium in which you can do that in. Um, and, and Zoom is, is some, this has been, this experience and that experience, is it helpful to the playwright, these 
especially this one was beautiful, but sometimes when we do it on Zoom, it's it's never quite, you know, how one can imagine. Is it still useful for you as a player oh, to develop? Absolutely. The only thing that from the, the last invited reading that I missed was being able to sit and watch the audience respond to see what like really worked, what didn't, what, what you know, inspired them to laugh or when they needed to be quiet. So you, you miss that. And of course, during rehearsal, I'm, I'm notorious for joking around and, and having fun with the actors till either the director or the stage manager yelled at me to shut up. And it's hard to do that on Zoom because everybody's overlapping. Right everybody else but yeah i think it's you know it, the value is there if you look for the value and oh good i'm glad to hear that because we've done yeah. we've been working very hard i think we've done more uh developmental play we've done uh 14 plays since last may and we've been not we don't do them full out but we're working on them and we're always mindful whether it's uh helpful to the playwright or not in this particular form it's it is the communication is is difficult. You work a little bit for results as opposed to process, and there's certain well, things that come out. Especially if it's if it's a new play. I mean, if it's a new play and you're sitting with a director and talented actors, there's 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 no way that you're not gonna get something from it. I mean, it's 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 still the play, regardless of of what the medium is. Alec, you run a theater school. Um, how has that been working? Are you doing it? Are they uh, are you your own bubble or are you doing it all um, remotely? How are you working that out at the Academy? Uh, that's a great, great question. Uh, it, it's changing every single week, uh, <laughs> depending on the numbers and depending on the, the mayor's uh, uh, latest orders and GW's latest policies, of course. So we've been doing most of it on Zoom, to be frank. Um, oh. And uh, so, uh, some of our students are living in one apartment building and it's only them living there. So they're, they're forming kind of a little bubble, I think seven or eight of them. Um, and we do have some in-person classes that are masked and socially distanced, um, uh, but very few. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I agree, I agree with what Leslie said. It's not theater, you know, uh, it, it lacks that sort of communal feeling, that experience of, you know, the energy of the audience and the energy of the actors in the room. Uh, Zoom feels a little more like a like the energy that drives it is longing, you know, a longing, yeah. to be, a longing to be together uh, rather than a, you know, than an actual being together. Um, but we need a place for that longing right now, you know. Um, and as Leslie says, we need a place to work. Uh, uh, th those of us in the theater are really suffering uh, right now because the theaters are shut down. Lots of people have no work, and uh, you know, just to be able to do something creative uh uh is just important it's vital to us you know because what are, what are we going to do otherwise so we can't end on that down note so uh, do, what do we have what are you looking forward to in the next tw in 21. who are you alec can start first Oh, uh, besides a vaccine, I assume you mean. Um, yes, besides the vaccine. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> which I don't know if it'll come in 2021, uh, largely, I hope it does. Um, well, we, uh, we have a wonderful class this year, even though we are on Zoom, um, they're doing some wonderful work. We have a, a, a very odd and wonderful production of Winter's Tale coming up in December uh, that I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, we're kind of making Zoom and um, di the digital world part of the actual uh, place that the play takes oh, place. Right, uh, yeah. So, so that's going to be very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, I look forward in 2021 to getting back in the room with people. I really yeah. do. Uh, uh, you know, I, I really want that. Um, um, I, I'm continuing to do a lot of writing and uh, uh, have a couple of uh, film, little film things that I'm doing. So that's exciting. That's exciting. And how about you, Leslie? Well, as I said, I had this play that I've been developing for the, uh, the last couple of seasons at the Actors Studio. And I am excited to finally push her out into the, the world. I think it's a, it's a fun play. It's a, I think it can be very exciting um, for the actors involved. And, and I think it can be timely, especially now since you know, we're coming out of this pandemic and, and theaters, as Alex said, have been struggling everywhere and I think this play will provide an audience the opportunity to exhale 
Uh, so I'm looking forward to just like having that done in the in the real world. Well, Leslie, I hope you will let us read your new play. Oh, I, every every intention of it. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for talking to me and for sharing uh, your thoughts with our our YouTube audience. Um, and I hope uh, I wish you both great good luck in the next uh, year. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye.